welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about preparing for AP courses and beyond. My name is Ann Bolin, and before we get started, let me just share a little bit with you on how to participate in this webinar. On the right-hand side of your screen, you're going to have a panel, and in that panel, you should see a chat box near the bottom right. Because you're going to be in listen-only mode, if you have a question as we go on at any time during the presentation or at the end, please feel free to write your questions into that chat box. The presentation will last for about 25 minutes, and then we're going to have about five, uh, 15 to 20 minutes of question and answer near the end. Also, we're going to email you a copy of this presentation along with the audio version so that you can share it with your student if you'd like. For the last 20 years, I've been in the field of education. I was a former, I am a former Fairfax County public schools teacher, and in 1998, I left the county to start educational connections tutoring. I found that my true passion was actually working with kids one-on-one, -on -one, more than in a classroom of 30 students. And along the way, the company has grown quite a bit. We now employ about 200 tutors that work with students in all academic areas. We work with quite a few students in advanced level classes in high school for college credit, and those include AP classes, IB, and also honors classes as well. And I'm the author of the book, Homework Made Simple, Tips, Tools, and Solutions for Stress-Free Homework. Today I have with me Diana Algis. Diana, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Anne. Again, my name is Diana Algis, and I have over six years of teaching experience in DC and abroad. And in the past year, I've acquired over 300 hours of tutor coaching students from fifth grade to 12th grade in a variety of subjects and a variety of levels. And as my four years as a, a ninth grade biology teacher and AP biology teacher, one of my focuses because I was a ninth grade teacher, was helping other teachers align their curriculum to prepare students for AP level courses. Thanks, Diana. So it sounds like the skills that kids need um, for AP classes can help them in all academic areas. Can you just touch with us on some of those five key skills that all kids need? Exactly. No matter whether a student is currently taking an AP class or wanting to take an AP class in the future, using the following skills will, will help them build the tools they need to be successful. One of those is study groups, Cornell notes, deep critical thinking and reading, practice, 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 and knowing your AP syllabus. Great. Thanks, Diana. Tell us a little bit about study groups. So study groups might be the hardest thing for students to implement because they have such busy and varied schedules. But it is something I do highly recommend that if you have three or five friends that are in the same class, even if they're not in the same class but are taking the same course, you meet with them once a week at a minimum and have a clear goal of things you're going to talk for 30 minutes or even an hour, whether you're going to be talking about a lab, a poem, analyzing a poem, if you're going to be studying for a big test coming up, you come prepared with questions so that this is the opportunity that you can really verbalize this information, but it's not your sole study time. That's such a good point, Diana, because it seems like in these advanced college level classes that kids really can't go it alone. And the great thing is that with technology, I've seen a lot of kids, even my son, um, doing study groups, even if it's just with one other student on FaceTime. And I know a lot of kids use Skype and other technologies as well. Have you found a trend in that direction? Yes, I have. You've seen Google groups, Google Hangouts, FaceTime, Skype. These are really great opportunities for students to maximize technology and integrate um, their skills into the, the modern world. And by doing so, they're really, really getting an idea of the information that they're learning because they're hearing it from different sources and not just their teacher. Right, and that's a big difference because studying really has to be multimodal. It can't just be reading something, and that's the mistake that many kids make. 84% of kids study by rereading their notes. But when you talk to somebody about it, you're getting that verbal component too. Exactly. Diana, speaking of notes, tell us a little bit about Cornell notes and why they can help students ace that AP class. 
Well, Cornell notes are a particular style of notes. And as you can see, they have at least three sections on a notebook paper. However, the thing with Cornell notes is you can really tailor it to meet the needs of your particular class. The big thing is that you're leaving space on the paper so that you can write down questions you might have, concepts that are confusing to you, and insights of your own while you're listening to the lecture. The most important part of the Cornell notes um, is the summary section. This is the section that really gives you an opportunity to synthesize this information that you've been listening to for 50 to 90 minutes and it gives you a little bit of time to um, think about did you understand the content that was discussed that day in class and if you do then you have a very clear summary and a quick go-to when you are studying for an exam or a quiz and if you don't quite understand it it gives you that opportunity to go to your teacher and ask a very specific question so that he or she can help you understand the concept. That's great, Diana. And what I love about Cornell Notes is although we have this fancy diagram, kids don't need to use special paper. In fact, if they, even if they don't use the left and right columns, if they simply, like you said, drew a line at the bottom of their paper, and when they get home that evening, summarize their notes in a few bullet points, just putting it into their own words is super powerful with learning. Exactly. Diana, tell us about why deep critical reading is so important to mastering an AP class. So when you get to AP level classes, you might feel overwhelmed with reading. And if you are a parent of a student who is entering high school or even middle school, practicing these techniques with reading now will help when they get to the AP class. And even if they aren't um, currently in the younger grades, but they're in an AP class, this is a skill that will help them in college and beyond. And it's really kind of dependent on the type of course that you decided to major in. You know, there's humanity style critical reading, and then there's math and science style critical reading, which we'll discuss. And for humanity, so for your English and your history, you're going to have to read a text three times. Now that doesn't mean you're reading the entire book or the entire article three times. What that means is that you're going through a process that's three steps long, where you're going to preview and speculate, you're going to read for understanding, and you're going to identify themes. And then, especially important for history and English classes, you need to know the context of the text, when and why it was written. And sometimes, even though you can't do this on an exam or necessarily in class, if you're at home, read the text out loud. It starts giving you another opportunity to process that information internally because hearing it through your ears and then having your brain process it versus just reading it and then taking it through your eyes, it gives your brain an opportunity to integrate it at a different level. Diana, what does preview and speculate mean? Does that mean just, for example, if you're reading a, store, um, a short story that you might um, read the intro and then skim it quickly or tell me a little bit about those three different things. So preview and speculate is a little bit of skimming, a little bit of, of reading an introduction and then reading a conclusion. For English you might not want to read the conclusion because it could re ruin the book for you, but you do want to read the introduction. You definitely want to read the back cover, any chapter headings that you find in the table of contents and kind of look at the copyright date. When was this text, not test, text first written. For history though, it is definitely something that you want to do is read the conclusion. So for history, you're going to read the introduction and the conclusion of the document in order to prepare yourself for what's going to come in between. So Diana, is the reason that when you have an idea of what you're going to read about, you have something to anchor this new information to? Exactly. When you already have an idea of where you're going, it makes it a lot easier for you to, to start planting the information that you pick up along the way to that anchor. So if the first part is just previewing and speculating, it's, it's, you're not obviously reading everything, is the next part read for understanding? Is that when you're going to really dig a little bit deeper and read the whole text? That is exactly when you're reading the entire text because that's where you're going to have to figure out the who, what, when, why, and how questions for this text. These are typically the multiple choice questions that you'll be getting on a quiz or a test. 
And by doing that, you'll, you'll have read the entire text, but because you've previewed and speculated already, doing step three is going to become a little bit easier for you. So what exactly is identifying themes in step three? So for English, especially since if you're going to be taking an AP English, AP English is very much focused on English culture. And English culture is, is rooted in Greek, Roman mythology, and Judeo-Christian ideologies. And currently, that's the way the curriculum is set up. So knowing your gods and your goddesses and your illusions and other um, allegories is going to help you identify certain themes in an English text that you can then use to analyze and discuss during your AP class. For history, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be essentially identifying where history is repeating itself. There's a cliche that says history repeats itself and it comes from somewhere um, on purpose because history really does repeat itself. So if you start reading a lot of the news outlets and what the Washington Post, New York Times, or listening to the nightly news, you'll start seeing connections from whether it's ancient history or Renaissance history or even World War II, you'll, you'll start to see as human behavior repeats itself, um, that's a very common theme in history. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks, Diana. No problem. And then for math and science, it's a little bit different. You're still going to be doing the three same steps, and it is still encouraged that you read the text out loud because especially in, in science, you can get some pretty big Latin, Greek-based words in your um, vocabulary that when you read them, you might say them a certain way, but when you say them out loud, they sound different. And then when you hear your teacher say them, you don't even know what the word was because you're saying it a different way. Hmm. How do you, one of the things I've heard from a lot of tutors is that their students really don't know how to read a math textbook. And when they get home, unless they, you know, have somebody to explain to them, they're really at a loss unless they have great notes. What's the key to reading a math textbook? So you, you may notice that your textbook's pretty heavy, and there's a lot more than just numbers in the textbook. And it's highly recommended that you read chapter headings and subheadings. If you're going to be doing um, learning about derivatives, what exactly are you going to be learning about derivatives in your calculus class or algebraic functions or um, geometric shapes? And the same goes for your science textbooks. Science textbooks are very detailed with their chapter headings, almost to the point that their sentences and their subheadings. And it really gives you an idea of the type of information you're going to be reading about. Okay. And then for, for science, more so than math, there are, these idea, there are these things called big ideas. And while you're reading the text, what you'll want to figure out, and it would be really helpful with a study group, is how does this content relate to a big idea? And I'll be discussing those things later. For math, you might be talking about how, how does this problem, how is this problem being discussed? How is it used in the real world? Diana, I wanted to ask you, that term, big ideas, does that come from the College Board, the organization that publishes the SAT and the AP curriculum? Yes, it does. It, they used to be called the, the themes of science, and then when they revamped the, when, and they're in the process of revamping the science AP curriculum, and now they're calling these things big ideas. And I will be going into a little bit more details, but essentially there are themes in science that you see repeated, whether they're in chemistry, biology, or physics, or environmental science. Okay, great. Okay, so once you, once you have been officially introduced to these things called big ideas, and even if you're taking a ninth or a 10th grade science class, your teacher will still be talking about themes in the class. You then want to be able to look and read the text for understanding. You still want to answer the who, what, when, why questions. But you also want to have the big idea in the back of your head, like evolution or um, atoms make up all matter. Those are the things that you kind of want floating around in the background and to see how does this information support 
that idea. Great. Thanks, Diana. And I also want to uh, remind our listeners that if you have a question, please fill in the chat box on the right-hand panel of your screen. Diana, how about practice, practice, practice? Tell us a little bit about that. So practice, practice, practice comes from the idea of the more you practice something, the better you will be at it. And when it comes to getting the source of practice material, I highly recommend the College Board because as mentioned earlier, these are the people that are making the test like the SAT. They're also responsible for creating the AP exams as well as the AP curriculum. All AP teachers have to submit their syllabi to the College Board for approval before they actually teach a class. So going to this website, it gives you an overview of all the courses that um, the College Board offers in the AP levels and it gives you kind of study hints and access to previous exams given in years before. Wow, that sounds really valuable if students can go back and look at old exams. I bet that's helpful in studying. It is very helpful because the AP test is a very specific kind of test and the more you practice it, the better you will be. And so to kind of give you some of that practice for English and history, again, your number one source is to go to the College Board website, but there's also plenty of other AP study guides out there if you want to get more of a variety of information or you just want to have like a tangible book to, to hold. Another thing is that you, you definitely want to have a varied repertoire of your reading whether it's articles, blogs, editorials, um, biographies, even graphic novels like manga, it gives you an idea of how people are articulating themselves via the written word, and it will help you sort of develop your own style of writing along the way. And along with developing your own writing style, a really great way to get that done is to follow this old advice from Ian e. Forrester where he was like, write down your ideas, say them to somebody, and then rewrite them again because your writing will always evolve when you go from written word to verbal word and written word and you, and you can keep doing this in a cycle until you find the piece that's truly your voice and truly what you want to say. And it's a really great idea to start that um, style of writing earlier than later because the more you do it, the easier it will be and on the test, you won't be able to vocalize your ideas. That's such a great idea. I love that. It sounds like kids could do that um, with their parents, with friends. But do they really need to bounce that off of other people? Could they just say it out loud? You could say it to your dog if you wanted to. The point is that you are hearing it yourself. Okay, got it. And then another big pet peeve of mine as a, as a former teacher as well is knowing your audience. Nothing is more frustrating when a student writes a sentence and it's an incomplete thought because they know you know what they're talking about. Don't ever assume the person reading your writing knows anything. Ever. And then another thing is to be able to understand the jargon that you are going to use for analyzing a particular um, text. So this, the language that you're going to use for analyzing a poem is going to be slightly different than the language you're going to use um, from analyzing an article or a piece of um, prose. Diana, how about math? How um, do practice quizzes or other study techniques help kids to do well in AP math courses? So for math, it really is a lot of practice problems. So one of the first things you want to do in your um, first day of class is kind of ask your teacher what are other sources of um, practice materials that you can use over the school year. The other thing that you want to make sure of, because if your goal is to take the AP exam, you time your homework. You know how long it takes for you to do a certain type of problem so that you can then kind of manage your time appropriately when taking a quiz or a test or even the AP exam. You also want to make sure you show all of your work. By showing all of your work, you can easily identify where in your process 
you made a mistake. So if you get to the end and you get a number that doesn't make sense, you can go through and find out, was it a sign problem? Did you do an arithmetic? Um, was there an arithmetic issue? Or did you actually really not know how to do this problem and you need to have a conversation with your professor? That makes sense. Thank you so much, Diana. We just have about five minutes left. What can you tell us about science? For science, again, I would use the College Board as a source of um, getting free response questions. The free response questions, you can get those from previous years, and it's highly recommended that you read and grade other students. The great thing about College Board is that they actually upload a variety of um, responses provided by students in previous years, and you can use those to grade the, the, the essays. And then you can actually practice by writing your own essays and grading them because the rubrics will always be provided. I love that idea. I know a lot of our tutors do that with their students, and the kids really love it too because it's, they're not getting criticized. They're critiquing another student's writing, and it seems to be a very powerful learning tool. Yeah, students are typically harsher than their own teachers. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Tell us a little bit about the AP syllabus and why knowing that is so important to success. So as mentioned earlier, your AP teacher has to submit a syllabus to the College Board. And your AP test is given on a very specific date every year. So there's a timeline that your teacher needs to follow in order to cover all the content that you need to know to be successful in that test. Typically, that information can be found on your syllabus. So by looking at it in the first day, you kind of get a road map of where you're going each month, if not maybe even each week, depending on how detailed your teacher gets. But it gives you a better idea of when is the course going to be easy for you, when are the challenges going to come up, and you can start to manage that ahead of time. That's a great idea. And kind of this is we're skipping ahead a little bit, but I did mention the big ideas earlier, and I inserted them into this PowerPoint so that you don't have to look very far for them and actually dig into the College Board website. So I've provided biology and um, chemistry's big ideas, um, just to kind of keep in the background for um, your AP student. But otherwise, I'm just going to move ahead a little bit and really kind of talk about an issue that everyone can work on, and that is time management. Since you're given that AP syllabus, you kind of have a very general calendar already. However, you need to have your own calendar as well, because more than likely, your students are going to be involved in extracurricular activities, and they're taking other classes. So knowing when the big tests, the big projects, the big games are, then you have a better way of managing your time. The other big thing with taking an AP course or a course that's supposed to lead you to AP is making sure you make time every day. I know for some schools they have block scheduling, but even if you don't have that course that day, you want to allot a minimum to 30 to 45 minutes where you are looking, synthesizing your notes, talking with a friend about the content, looking over the textbook or um, the reading book so that you won't be given an opportunity to fall behind. And to remember that cramming is never a strategy. It gets it into the short-term memory, but AP classes, they are year-long, and that's a lot of content to cram even at the last minute. That's great advice. I know that many of the students we work with are really smart and they can do very well and less advanced classes and cramming can work for them, but definitely not in AP and IB classes. No. What, um, tell us a little bit about how the exam works, whether it's required or not, and the score a student needs to earn to receive college credit. So the score a student needs to receive college credit really depends on the college. And what you'll want to do is contact a college admissions officer to get more specific information about that. It may also be on the college's website. Um, but you are either allotted a 1 or a 5. The 5 is um, the highest grade you can get on an AP exam. 
and either a three or above is considered passing in general, but some schools actually require fives to get college credit depending on your major and just depending on the college that you're um, um, applying to. The other thing to think about is that all exams are given in the first two weeks of May. They start at either 8 a.m. or 12 noon and they last only three hours with sometimes one or two breaks um, during those three hours. The other thing is that you have to register for this test. Just because you're in an AP course doesn't mean you're automatically signed up to take the test. So it does depend on your school and you'll want to talk to your AP teacher about how this is set up, but most definitely your counselor can help you with this if the school does not sign you up automatically. Uh, the other thing to remember is that you can't bring anything into the room. And your teachers probably will tell you this as well, but you especially don't want to bring a, a cell phone in because that will mean that your test is negated and it could negate everyone's test in the room that is with you. The other thing to think about, if you are actually paying for this test, which is about $90 these days, you might consider asking your teacher if they think you are ready for the exam. If an AP teacher has been teaching for quite a few years, they probably can gauge on how well a student is um, going to do on the exam. And if you know the, the grade that you need to get, to get credit, then it gives you a better idea of whether or not you want to actually spend that money to take the test. That's a really good point. I never thought of that. What else should parents know and students know, Diana? About the exam? Sure. You know, um, one question that I hear often is, do you have to report your score to, to colleges? You don't have to report your scores, but just keep in mind sometimes there are fees where if you um, want to send the scores to a school later on, the college board might charge you for that later on. Okay, makes sense. Great, thank you, Diana. No problem. How about our next slide, the contact information? Um, that We listed that out here for parents and students if they have any questions to contact either me or you. But we have a couple of questions from the chat line that I'd like to ask you, and some of them are actually pretty common that we hear quite often. The first one is, how many AP classes should a student take, or what do colleges like to see? I think that's a, a kind of a difficult question to answer because what the colleges like to see is really a, a well-rounded individual who can apply themselves and challenge themselves, but within within reason. Like they don't want you to take an AP course if you're going to get a D in that course. Um, if you're going to get a C, it might be something that you need to debate and kind of figure out with your teacher whether or not you have the opportunity to raise that grade. If you know you can get an A or a B in one of your AP classes, then I would take as many as you feel comfortable with, knowing that the workload is going to be heavy and that some AP classes may be harder than others depending on your specialties. Diana, a parent just said, can you, can you talk about how an AP class might be different than a non-AP class in terms of um, how the student should prepare their homework load, their class workload? What's the big difference? So probably the biggest difference is the amount of work in a given amount of time. And what that means is that you might be asked to read, and this isn't over an exaggeration, but 100 pages in one night, whereas in a regular class it might be only 50 pages. But 100 pages actually isn't that much to read for an English or history uh, class. You're right. And, and also, most students around here are on block schedules. How does block scheduling impact um, the workload for students? I've seen that, at least some of the students I've worked with over the years, because of block scheduling, they're more likely to procrastinate and put off that AP homework or even just regular homework until the night before it's due. Um, that doesn't really work for AP classes so well. What do you think, Diana? 
So block scheduling is kind of a double-edged sword for AP classes because in some ways for the students who are, are really slow processors, it gives them that extra day to kind of process that information, go to the teacher, ask questions, and then come to the next class prepared. However, for those students who do procrastinate, they really need to focus on allotting that time of 30 to 45 minutes each day, A day or B day, to their AP courses, each course. That makes sense. Another thing um, that we often hear about is students that are perfectionists, and often these kids are girls, and they will spend an inordinate amount of time on their homework, um, especially when they know they these are AP classes, they want to do a good job on the exam. Do you have any advice for the student who kind of goes in the other direction and sometimes goes overboard? So for the student who goes overboard, I would highly suggest a couple different strategies. Um, if they're for like a math or a science class where they're really being a perfectionist on that regard, I would recommend they use a timer and then they can only um, do whatever that science or math activity is for 30 minutes and then they have to move on to another subject and then come back to it later and just do that cycle of doing the activity for a certain amount of time leaving the activity and then coming back to it later. It's also important that they have a very set bedtime because one of the, the biggest mis misconceptions students could have is thinking that spending that four hours between 10 um, p.m. and 2 a.m. is actually going to make their product or their studying better when in actuality it's just going to make it worse. One and, then thing. For, oh, and then I'm just going to say for history and English perfectionists, what I would really think about is their writing and their reading process. And what I mean by that is they do an outline, take a break. They do a draft and take a break. And a lot of times in your AP history and English classes, you do have written assignments that can be spaced out like that. And so don't think that you are the thing that you're doing at the moment is your final product. Writing is a process and taking it step by step will really help that perfectionist in slowing it down. Diana, at one of our workshops, our tutor workshops last week, uh, we were discussing this issue and a lot of tutors chimed in. Um, one girl in particular, Michelle, had this great idea and I loved it and she said she has a number of students that are perfectionists and she created this um, little chart with them and the chart is divided into three sections. The first section is called must do, the next one is should do, and then the last one is could do. So for all of the tasks that the student wanted to do, they put them in either category. And so the must do's were the things that the student really had to do. They were homework assignments, they were research papers, they, the student got a grade, like other homework assignments. The should do were things that would be nice to do, but it wasn't necessary to get a good grade. And those were things like annotate as you read. And then the could do, those were things that were not essential. For example, if the, the teacher says, oh, by the way, I saw a great article in the Washington Post, you might want to read it. Sometimes perfectionists will think, oh my gosh, I have to do that. But really you don't, that's a could do. It's not at all essential. Um, and she found that by creating this chart with her students, it really helped them see okay, I, can, I, I really don't have to do the could-dos right now, um, but I have to do the must-dos and I probably want to tackle the should-dos. And then she also had them, um, they, had, they agreed not to do anything on the should-do or the could-do list after 10 o'clock. And I thought that was a great idea. That sounds like a really awesome idea and I think it could be applied to other students with even time management issues, especially with the idea that an a, of an A day, B day, some students' schedules might have all of their harder um, homework heavy classes on an A day and have a pretty light B day and still making those lists of priorities will help them kind of distribute the homework over those two days so that they um, don't feel overwhelmed on A day nights. Or B -day. Diana, how do you think a tutor can help students with AP classes? Well. One of the biggest things I do as an AP science tutor 
is I really focus on getting the students to synthesize the information. Um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that a lot of times teachers will hand out PowerPoints and then students kind of don't write down notes and they, they kind of zone out in class. And so the biggest thing they have is actually understanding what was said in class just by looking at the PowerPoint. And so really getting those students to focus on um, analyzing that information and kind of internalizing it through the, the verbal process. I would have them teach me about a particular um, topic that was covered that week. Um, for other students, just getting them prepared time-wise for the AP exam, because, you know, especially for students who might be slightly slower readers, or they might take a little bit longer on problems, or they kind of overthink an issue, getting them, um, giving them testing strategies to be more successful on the exam. That sounds great, Diana. Thank you so much for that information. Well, this has been terrific. I know I've learned a lot myself, and I've really enjoyed hearing your tips. I appreciate you being on our webinar today, and to all the parents, thank you so much. I, felt, I hope that you found it to be helpful, and if you have any questions, feel free at any time to contact Diana or myself. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Thank you.